Thank you so much, uh, Crystal, and thank you so much to the Asia, Asia Society of Switzerland for having me and inviting me here to be your moderator today for um, a topic that is incredibly important and very, very relevant because, let's face it, we're all at home right now um, because of the illegal wildlife trade and its connection to COVID. Um, so we've got a great lineup today. We have the this structure, which we're going to show you right now, which will be the structure of the webcast. Um, and that will be a moderated conversation focusing on the demand for wildlife in Asia and the role of traditional Chinese medicine, coronavirus and recent wildlife policy changes in China and other Asian countries, and strategies to reduce illegal wildlife trade and the stories of success plus minus on, of different approaches. So we have um, uh, a wonderful guest here who will be sharing the platform with us today, and that is Aaron White. And Aaron is an illegal wildlife campaigner and China specialist at the Environmental Investigation Agency, which is an international NGO based in London and Washington, DC. And it's dedicated to investigating and campaigning against environmental crime and abuse. Now, Aaron has worked on uh, illegal wildlife trade and conservation issues following a degree in Chinese, and spent time living in Beijing and Taipei. Now, Aaron's work at EIA focuses primarily on trade and conservation of big cats and wildlife trade policy more generally in China. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us as well here today. Um, and I'd like to hand over to you now to give your presentation. Thank you very much, Nadia, for that fantastic introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to be initially giving a, a, a brief introduction to, to wildlife trade and why we're discussing it today. Um, I know many of the, the people on, on this uh, webcast are familiar with some of these issues, so I'll, I'll try and get through this quite quickly. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be starting by trying to dispel some misconceptions around wildlife trade. So uh, just very briefly, the term wildlife trade can refer to a whole host of, of activities. Um, in its broader sense, it can mean use of timber, trading in live plants and um, fisheries, uh, trading captive bred animals as well. So just to keep in mind that wildlife trade is a very complex um, term and it's very complex. Um, it can refer to many, many different activities. Today, we're going to be focusing on trade in wild animals. Uh, another misconception is that wildlife trade and illegal wildlife trade are the same thing. And um, we should bear in mind that a lot of wildlife trade is actually legal. And um, what is and isn't legal and illegal depends on international law. There's a, a convention called CITES, which uh, determines which species can be traded internationally, um, and also domestic laws. So whether an activity is legal or illegal varies hugely depending on where you are. Um, we must also bear in mind that something being legal does not necessarily mean it's not a problem in terms of biodiversity or human health. Um, Something being legal does not necessarily mean it's effectively regulated. Um, there are many um, gaps and uh, inconsistencies with how wildlife trade is regulated internationally and within countries. It doesn't necessarily mean it's sustainable. Um, often uh, there are wildlife trade is happening without any real understanding of what the population levels are of that species or what the impact is on that species in the wild. Um, it's not always ethical. Uh, a lot of legal wildlife trade has a lot of really serious implications in terms of the uh, welfare uh, impact on, on the animals and the levels of mortality. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was actually sourced legally. Um, an, an example here is reptiles that are traded legally as pets within the EU, but actually they were uh, taken from the wild in Sri Lanka, which were illegal to take um, reptiles from the wild. Um, also, a legal market in a species can be associated with illegality. It might be that that species is smuggled in, uh, illegally, and the existence of a legal market is kind of keeping this demand alive and telling consumers that it really it's a legitimate thing to be consuming. And also, human health. Um, bacteria and viruses don't care if a species, if a, yeah, if a given example of wildlife trade is legal or illegal. So we need to be concerned about all of these things and there's been a lot of conversations happening this year around um, what trade should be allowed and whether we need to be expanding um, prohibitions and, and restrictions far beyond the existing frameworks. I just want to touch on the term, um, the terms wet market and wildlife market. I think this, these two terms have been conflated a lot, in, particularly in Western media, um, in in 2020 and we need to understand that a, a wet market really 
just refers to a market predominantly in, in China and Southeast Asia where fresh produce is sold. Uh, in a minority of these markets, wildlife um, is also sold, but it's not the case for most. So calling for closure of all wet markets because of concerns around illegal wildlife trade really doesn't make any sense. So we need to be um, ensuring that we're not kind of, uh, helping to perpetuate these quite xenophobic narratives. Uh, another misconception is that wildlife trade and illegal wildlife trade only happens in certain parts of the world. Um, it's absolutely not just a phenomenon in Asia. Um, to here on this slide are two examples of illegal wildlife trade in Europe. On the left are European eels, which are trafficked in huge quantities. And on the right, these are um, some images of, of products that were seized by the UK border force. So illegal wildlife trade is absolutely a global phenomenon. This is a map, a map that shows seizures of rhino horn from illegal trade and uh, locations of convictions related to rhino horn trade. Now, this is a, a trade that we think of as largely being from southern Africa and um, rhino horn being smuggled to markets in Asia. But you can see from this map actually a lot of countries around the world are implicated, particularly in Europe and America as well. So even these traditional um, the trades that are traditionally conceived of as Africa to Asia are far more complex than that. Now, obviously, this is a, an Asia Society uh, webcast, so we will be focusing on, on wildlife trade in Asia and understanding that it is a global issue and requires a global response. Um, there are some examples here in the images of species that are trafficked um, and subject to illegal trade in Asia. Uh, and even within Asia, there are, there's a huge variety of ways in which wildlife is traded, reasons it might be consumed and species involved. Um, here on the left, we have some uh, jewelry that is made out of tiger teeth and tiger claws, and underneath that, a tiger skin that's being prepared to be turned into a rug. So decorative, um, performative, and conspicuous consumption as a reason for consumption of wildlife. Next is a, a photograph of a menu in a restaurant in Laos where various wild animals are offered, including uh, reptiles, a pangolin, and bear paws prepared as bear paw soup. Um, next along is a waistcoat made out of snow leopard fur that was offered for sale in China. Um, and finally is a, a baby gibbon that was being offered for sale as a pet in Vietnam. So all of these species are seriously threatened uh, due in part to poaching and trafficking um, in Asia. Just focusing only on tigers as an example of to see the complexity of wildlife trade in Asia alone. This is a, a map taken from a recent EIA report on tiger trade. Um, and with these green arrows, you can see all of the different routes that um, traffic, uh, tigers are being trafficked through. Um, you have wild tigers being moved from, uh, from South Asia, from Malaysia, from Thailand towards demand markets. You also have captive tigers moving, for example, from Thailand into Laos, from Laos into Vietnam, from Vietnam into China. And you have convergence of different routes of wild tigers, of captive tigers, and um, just this one species, um, there's a huge level of complexity. So it's difficult to kind of to, to speak in general terms around where is wildlife moving within Asia. It really depends on the, the species and the location and the context. So I uh, work as a China specialist at the Environmental Investigation Agency, uh, focusing on um, wildlife policy and wildlife trade in China. Uh, a focus on China in particular is justified when we're talking about um, wildlife trade globally for several reasons. Um, it is what's known as a mega diverse country, which means a significant proportion of the world's biodiversity as a whole lives in China. So the way in which these species are, are managed and the conservation status of species in China is of global importance. Um, also, state investment, um, particularly the Belt and Road Initiative, which is an um, umbrella term that used to refer to infrastructure and non-infrastructure investments by the Chinese state and other Chinese entities in other countries, has potentially huge impacts on biodiversity and wildlife trade. So for example, there are infrastructure um, and border projects happening in areas which are already major locations for illegal wildlife trade and without mitigation measures could actually make this a lot worse. And, and finally, demand from some Chinese consumers are, um, is, is a major driver of illegal trade and in several species. Um, we must make the point always that um, this consumption represents a very small minority of people in China and the vast majority of people in China are not engaged in this kind of activity and a huge number of people are actually working in wildlife protection and aiming to um, improve the policies and implementation of those policies for protection of wildlife. But there is a, a complexity in China whereby the 
government policy in many cases is actually legitimizing the consumption of species that are threatened by trade. We have here um, three images of products that are sold legally with um, government knowledge and approval. Um, on the left here is a tiger skin rug um, as with a government permit uh, next to it, which was offered for sale in, in 2012. Uh, in the middle is a traditional Chinese medicine product that contains the bile of captive bred bears. And um, this was being offered uh, on a website of the manufacturer in 2020. And on the right is a tonic wine that contains leopard bone. Now, in all of these cases, we have a government policy which rather than uh, aiming to reduce the demand of these products is actually serving to legitimize it, to tell the consumers who would be interested in these products that it's okay and, and legal and acceptable to consume them. So it's a complex picture in China and it is really worth getting into some more detail, which I hope to, to do in the next half an hour. Thank you, Aaron. Um, it, it's interesting. I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm sure that some demand redu reduction campaigns have been run in China. I know that the shark's fin campaign uh, and Ivory also has had uh, sort of quite good success in, in reducing demand. Um, is it just a case of going through, you know, one species at a time to try and educate the consumers um, to reduce the demand uh, on the ground? Because when you, when you really do focus on demand reduction, it really does help at the end of the day, reduce the numbers of um, species that are being taken out. And of course, then, you know, there's the other complex issue, issue of looking at um, alternative livelihoods, like where do uh, the people who are trading uh, in these um, illicit products go? And what do they then start trading? And I know that's a sort of multi-pronged question, but maybe you can just share a little bit of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think um, reducing demand for products that are um, made out of species threatened by trade is an absolutely essential um, part of the, the way that this is dealt with. Um, and reducing demand is complex. How it's done best is dependent on the species um, and, and the context in which it's consumed. It's very complex and requires lots of different activities. Um, and I think that one crucial part of the puzzle in reducing demand is government policies that are that make clear that consumption of a given product is unacceptable and is not is not legitimate, it's not encouraged. Um, so we have seen some some good examples in China where that's happened. For example, the um, ban on processing and trade of ivory and came about in 2017. Um, but unfortunately, that hasn't yet been extended to other species that are similarly threatened by trade. Um, and you know, banning, for example, uh, use of pangolin scales in traditional medicine, that's not a silver bullet. It's not going to immediately um, eliminate the demand, but I think it is a really essential part of the suite of actions, which includes provision of alternative livelihoods. It means um, providing uh, an alternative for um, two pangolin scales that is used in, in those formulations, which many um, traditional medicine practitioners already have replaced these, these products in, in those formulations. Um, it means enforcement of those laws, raising awareness of the policy change. Um, but particularly in China, uh, it's very difficult to have a totally effective demand reduction campaign when the, that campaign is not necessarily in um, coherence with the government policy. I think there's, there are restrictions, obviously, on activities um, of NGOs in, in publicly criticizing the, mm. or campaigning against the existing policy. And it, there's a mismatch, really, when you have um, NGO campaigns saying, you know, don't consume X, Y, Z, but you have um, you know, legal trade, these same products being advertised openly with government permission. It's, I think mm. that, uh, a, a kind of zero tolerance approach to consumption of species that are threatened by trade from the government is an essential part of of what is needed um, and yeah I think as you said rather than it being species by species approach we want, we want to see a change in the law that says species that are threatened by trade can no longer be commercially uh, traded. And what, are, what do you think in your view is, is the greatest obstacle to actually getting there? It's been very interesting to note this year the extent to which this issue has been um, debated and discussed in China. And there are a huge number of people in the country, um, in, from anything from, from NGOs to academics and even lawmakers, members of the National People's Congress, have been publicly stating that the policy needs to change and there needs to be a more precautionary approach to, to wildlife trade and there needs to be an exp expansion of restrictions really on, on what is not allowed. I think what is the impediment is difficult to say, obviously where um, decision making processes can be quite opaque. Certainly there are vested interests and there are um, powerful industry 
um, lobbies that are, for example, pushing for the opening of um, legal trade in, in tiger products. But I feel uh, at the moment quite, um, quite positive that there's a, a real um, movement in, in, in China and in many other countries for, from, uh, as people are paying attention to these issues increasingly to say, okay, we really need to change, um, change tack. And you know, zooming out from that, the, uh, we've had uh, major reports in the past few years telling us that the biodiversity loss is an absolute global crisis that threatens the systems upon which we all depend. So this is only going to get more important. And hopefully these voices in China are, are listened to by decision makers and, and in other countries. And these issues are taken much more seriously. Mm. It, what, can you maybe share with us a little bit about some of the consumption patterns uh, that are particular to China and Asia um, and through traditional medicine maybe and through some of the uh, the wildlife that is consumed um, and anything that, that has changed maybe over the last you know six months as well. Yeah um, I think wildlife is well traditional medicine is a good example firstly it should be noted that wildlife is consumed as medicine around the world it's absolutely not um, just in China, there are um, traditions in you know in every continent to do this, um, and it's not always a problem. Um, often, you know, use of a, a wild grown herb as a as a medicine is is effective and and doesn't have to be um, unsustainable. And um, what's unique, I would say, in China is a highly developed um, and highly regulated uh, system of um, traditional Chinese medicine, which is it's industrial in scale, and it is it's. It's kind of made very official through, for example, the pharmacopoeia of, of the government's pharmacopoeia says these, spe uh, these species are officially recognized um, medicinal ingredients and these formulations are you know, kind of like a recipe for producing a, a given treatment. These are officially recognized and in these documents you see products such as bear bile, pangolin scales, leopard bone. Um, and that the level to which these, uh, these products are being legitimized in medicinal use is is I think, yeah, as I said, an impediment to reducing demand. So those species I've already mentioned can currently be traded and used legally in China, leopard bone, pangolin scales, the bile of captive bred bears, um, musk, which is um, taken from the glands of musk deer, um, saiga horn, which is the horn of an antelope, a critically endangered antelope, which lives in Central Asia. Um, all of these are officially recognized in these kind of documents. Now, you, you mentioned uh, policy changes that have happened this year. Um, there has been a, a major po policy changes in China, uh, the biggest of which being, say, in fe late February, the National People's Congress Standing Committee, which is the biggest, the most important um, lawmaking body in the country, passed a decision that banned the commercial breeding and trade of most terrestrial wild animals for consumption as food. So that was a significant change from what the policy had been. Um, in which only consumption of threatened species, of protected species, was was prohibited. And we thought at the time, if this is rolled out ethically and effectively, if the people who have been uh, engaged in that farming are, are helped and are compensated and afforded, you know, trained in alternative livelihoods, then it should be a positive move. But it didn't go far enough in that it did not ban um, any other form of trade, so traditional medicine, um, ornamental items, pets, all of these were left untouched. And even more than that, when the policy was rolled out, uh, government guidance was saying um, if the species you, you were breeding as food can be used as medicine, then just you should pivot your production towards the medicine market instead. Which just floods the market and makes it hard to regulate, right? And it seems to undermine the whole point of rolling out this policy in the first place, which was um, yeah. came about because of concerns due to human health risk of this close contact of, between species and between humans and those species. So it's not been consistent. It's, it hasn't been far enough. And we, we hope to see these um, restrictions expanded beyond just trade um, as food. So it's it's that things have changed but they've not gone far enough i mean it, it takes a long time sort of to turn the train around right do you think that um there it is it is not far enough yet but do you see that the wheels are in motion and that um uh it, it's sort of the kickstart of some positive change some more positive change i hope or so not just I yet 
<laughs> I, I hope that we will see more positive change. I think, um, as I said, there's been a, a lot of discussion among um, among Chinese advocates, among um, people of influence in the country, calling for greater restrictions. And there is an opportunity mm. this year, as the the wildlife protection law, which is the main piece of legislation covering these issues in China, is being revised. Uh, we are expecting to see another a revision by the end of this year and so lawmakers have an opportunity now to revise the law rather than as we said going species by species to say to close these um kind of provisions that currently allow for legal trade in protected species and to say you know if a species is protected it's now fully protected from commercial exploitation we're no longer going to allow the use in traditional medicine as rugs as, as um clothing however these species mm. are being traded and that while that opportunity is there, it's difficult to say right now what where the winds um, are blowing. I think there there's a a risk not just in China but around the world that as as you know attentions move on that we don't make the most of of this window in which political and public attention is really looking at wildlife trade. And um, I hope that it will happen, and we will be continuing to work to to push for that kind of change and 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 working with people in China who are working on this as well. But um, mm. It, yeah, we're certainly not there yet. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that's a, it's a very good point that you, you brought up there about behavioral change. And if COVID is not enough to shift behavioral change in mindsets, then, you know, we, we're in big trouble. And for somebody who's been speaking about environmental issues since 1996, it's very hard to see how habitual we are as human beings and um, how resistant we are to change. Now, you, you, we were talking about traditional Chinese medicine earlier, and we have a pre-recorded video coming up right now from Lixian Huang, who's the former president of the American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine. Now, she's really well known for her thoughts on consumption uh, reduction of illegal species in traditional medicine, and she's been advocating sustainability in Chinese herbal medicine and has spoken widely on the challenges and opportunities ahead since the 90s. There are really very big um, differences between the very well established medical practice in the hospitals and in the clinics of doctors practicing Chinese medicine than those who are in the industry of food. These are completely separated. However, often they're mixed up together and to put them all under the category of uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Animal products are seldom used as a one single, uh, you know, uh, component in Chinese medicine. The uh, major, you know, use of Chinese herbal medicine do not really depend on animal products, but rather than on natural plants and on the substance of uh, roots and the herbs growing or being farmed. The beginning of Chinese medicine 3,000 years ago um, did not face the issues we have today, um, such as endangered species. Uh, now it is practiced all over the world, I think in over a hundred countries. So Traditionally used uh, animal, you know, uh, substance in the medicine uh, have to be removed or have to be replaced. Uh, in 1993, Chinese government banned the use of tiger bones and rhino horns. Um, since the ban, Chinese medicine completely stopped using any products containing tiger parts or rhino parts for China to remove uh, very endangered, you know, uh, species uh, such as tiger and rhino, and then used other uh, replacement in the medical hospital system and saved those endangered species. There should be agencies in China really being aware of the trend of endangered species used in Chinese medicine. And, you know, I see that whether it's government agencies or the um, wildlife conservation uh, organizations, all international scientists, they are more reactive than being proactive. For Chinese medicine, this is another issue in terms of uh, lack of 
research or attention to what species could be endangered due to the demand. Um, I have not seen a comprehensive list of what um, animal products that are used in Chinese medicine from uh, classical formula, ancient formulas, and then to how those should be really researched in terms of they will be endangered if such a demand are put to those species. Therefore, the work should be starting now. Okay, so we heard from Li Xin there, um, and there was, there was one statement there that sort of jumped out at me, uh, at me there, um, and it was, she was talking about how Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine, I guess, in the, the, uh, under the official practices within the hospitals has banned the use of um, tiger and rhino, um, although the consumption rate is still very high. So that's obviously on the illegal side of things, right? Um, can you share with us, Aaron, um, what are the main species right now that are threatened by TCM? Um, and is it legal to use these threatened species um, in TCM in China? I think you had mentioned a little bit about this earlier, but I just want to make sure that we've got that covered nicely. Yeah, so there's um, a range of different categories, I guess, that you could that species might fall into. You've got the species that I mentioned earlier, so leopard, snow leopard, clouded leopard, um, pangolin, bear, uh, musk deer, saiga. Um, that's just the the mammals. Um, there are a huge number of, of other species which might be um, threatened. So a number of plant species, um, possibly snakes as well, um, that are used legally. So these are species that are officially listed, named in um, official documentation as a source of a legal uh, medicinal ingredient. And then there's also a kind of grey area of where you have species such as lion, where government permits are issued to produce uh, bone wine, which is labeled as, as containing lion, as a, sold as a medicinal tonic. Um, but lion isn't featured in these kind of, in these documents. This is similar with uh, elephant skin. Permits are given to produce um, elephant skin medicine, um, medicines containing elephant skin powder, but it's not listed in the pharmacopoeia, for example. And then as, as Li Xin, um, rightly made the point it's not just these species that have have been used traditionally and are included in these in these documents there's a whole host of other species that are potentially threatened that they might be harvested and sold as those species there might be some some fraud going on or it might be a kind of a substitute or even a, a just where it's available in a given area so we've seen for example in um, Suriname in South America jaguar bone being um, used to produce a, a product which is similar to that used um, that's made out of tiger bone in in Vietnam and in China so mm. it's not the impacts are not just restricted to, to the species that are in these official documents um, but the, the ones that are legally traded are, are those primary in terms of mammals the ones the ones that I mentioned um, there, there are some issues in, in even in the pharmacopoeia of what species are being referred to um, and it's you know there's some important work going on to to kind of assess the the conservation status of, the, of, of those species it's important that we understand what is being used what is then being impacted by those that that use and what might happen in the future yeah and also i mean you know as you were saying the the other species that uh that are kind of in the pipeline right uh i mean elephant skin and, and elephant blood bone uh, blood beads that are being sold i mean it's just incredible to see how many pieces of an animal can actually be sold, um, which is, is terribly sad at times. Now, another thing, another thing that I think is is, is an interesting point um, that we that to take into consideration is the fact that TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, is actually becoming more and more popular um, all over the world, and that's something that we need to to look at and um, consider the ingredients that go into that. Because I'm assuming that. Western audiences um, will be a little bit more selective about what they consume, right? So I'm, I'm guessing that as demand for that and the questions around the ingredients um, do change, that Chinese medicine will hopefully also adapt to uh, the increasing demand for things that are a little bit more um, ethical, yeah, yeah, I guess, I'm hoping. 
I think it's it's really important to, to recognize whenever we're talking about traditional Chinese medicine, as, as we just heard from Li Huang, Huang, uh, it's not traditional Chinese medicine as a whole that needs to be regarded as the problem here. Um, most Chinese medicine doesn't use um, body parts of, of threatened wild animals. Um, and the parts that are used can be replaced and already have been by many practitioners in many parts of the world. So it's, it's simply a case of uh, working with experts in in that discipline to to officially uh, you know ensure what is uh, what is being used to replace certain ingredients to make that official in the things such as the pharmacopoeia as was done for tiger burn and rhino horn and um, replace those ingredients but make sure that what's replacing them isn't another body part of a species that's then going to get threatened down the line which is what happened uh, with leopard bone being used to replace tiger bone and a cycle horn being used instead of rhino horn. So we need to be kind of taking a long view of these things. And in terms of the potential impact internationally, absolutely it, it could be a real problem. So what, what we want to see is firstly um, the Chinese government committing to ending the use of threatened species in China um, and ensuring that any um, expansion of uh, of kind of state-backed uh, investment in, in Chinese medicine in Africa, which is already happening in other countries in Asia and in Europe, is coincides with commitments to end the use of threatened wildlife um, in traditional Chinese medicine to ensure that it is not a driver of, of biodiversity loss and extinction, because it really doesn't have to be. Um, and it would be a win-win, really, for traditional Chinese medicine um, in terms of image if the mm. uh, official kind of man, uh, officially accepted use of these species is, is ended. Uh, yeah, it, it can, does not have to be a driver of biodiversity loss. And I hope that that's the direction that will be taken as is already being um, driven by kind of leaders such as Li Xinhuang that we've heard from. Mm -hmm. Now there's, as a result of COVID, and I think uh, in many ways COVID has provided a wonderful opportunity in, in, in many ways, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a positive, but what it has done is, is sort of pulled a band-aid off many sectors of our society that have remained hidden or uh, invisible or under the radar. And it's the same with the illegal wildlife trade. And it's a given it's an opportunity to renew the focus um, on the trade uh, and some of the practices around that. Now we have Dr. Sarah H. Olson and she's an Associate Director of Epi Epi Epidemiology for the um, WCS Health Program. Now, in a pre recorded input, she talks about a study that she and a team of scientists have worked on where they looked at the presence uh, and diversity of coronavirus in wildlife. So, to just give an introduction and overview to our study, we were really looking at these interfaces where people and wildlife come together in different interfaces in Vietnam. So, when I use the word interface, I'm talking about those places where people and wildlife come together in risky situations where pathogens could be transmitted um, between the two. We went into a couple different interfaces in Vietnam that we thought were particularly risky. So we looked at interfaces um, involving bat guano farming. Uh, so in these domestic areas and backyards where people um, recruit or attract bats and they then deposit their, their guano, which is used as fertilizer. Another interface was the wildlife farm interface where people are raising um, uh, wildlife for uh, human food consumption. And then we also looked at this interface of, of, the, of the rat trade. So where rats are collected in fields and they're brought into or by, mar by traders into markets and then they move from markets into restaurants where they're consumed. Um, and so these, these three interfaces we, we tested for coronaviruses. And we were testing for just coronavirus, the family, and, you know, everybody carries coronavirus, you know, dolphins have coronavirus and they're circulating normally. So these are, are not, you know, the ones that are going to cause zoonotic disease, but it's a, it's a model system to track how these viruses um, and how these processes of the wildlife trade or and these interfaces uh, can be, can be risk. One of the main findings is we, we found coronaviruses in all those interfaces and we found them ab above normal. So if you were to just go into a wild setting and sample rodents, we usually find detection rates of coronaviruses around zero to 2%. Um, and I think one of the most interesting findings in our study was the, the wildlife uh, supply chain, uh, the, that rat trade. So when we look carefully at that rat trade, and I had to go back and keep double checking my numbers uh, and, and the results. So we found in, um, in the traders, 
we were seeing levels around 20% positivity. We were able to detect coronavirus about 20% of the time. And then we went to these large markets. It was around 30% of the time. And by the time we got to the, the restaurants uh, where we were testing when they were slaughtering the, the, the rodents um, in the restaurant, we were detecting uh, coronavirus over 50% of the time. And what this speaks to is the rodent trade and the, and, the, and, the, and the wildlife trade in live animals in general, the processes there that are driving that. So you're bringing together animals from different geographies in the rodent trade, different species from all over. You're mixing them in confined um, cages um, where they're stressed, their immune system is compromised, um, they're, they're sharing you know, bodily fluids on each other. And this is promoting the spread. So the, the trade itself is amplifying the amount of, of viruses, in this case, coronavirus, that people could be, be potentially exposed to. I mean, if you're exposed to a rodent that, you know, zero out of uh, or one or two out of 100 have coronavirus, that's pretty low risk. But if you're, you know, handling an animal where over 50% of the animals in that cage are carrying a virus, that's going to really increase the potential risk of, of spillover into people. Uh, it's so interesting to see um, how the handling, the management, the stress on the animals um, directly increases the, the percentage of coronavirus uh, seen, seen there. Um, so that study, which um, appears in the preprint journal BioRxiv, is, is by a team of scientists from WCS led by Sarah, the Department of Animal Health uh, of the Vietnam Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, uh, Vietnam National uh, Viet um, University of Agriculture, Eco Health Alliance, and One Health Institute of uh, the University of California, Davis. Now, samples for the study were taken in Vietnam, as uh, Sarah had mentioned. Now, we're also here to talk a little bit about, um, actually, I wanted to ask Aaron, ask you a question here, um, going more into depth into the policy changes, right, uh, and how this has increased um, or the focus actually on health risks in um, uh, of the illegal wildlife trade, because that's also what uh, Sarah was talking about here. Um, can you share a little bit of insights from what you've been seeing uh, through some of the research and the intel that you have uh, uh, coming out of the ground in China? Yeah, so we've been um, closely monitoring the impacts of, of COVID-19, um, not just in terms of the conversations that are happening around health risks posed by the way we're treating the natural environment, um, but also quite literally how are um, the criminal networks responding and how has their trade been affected. I think on the whole, um, it's too soon to say what the long-term impacts will be, um, but it's certainly enough to say that um, illegal wildlife trade has not stopped um, in 2020, um, far from it. Um, on the one hand, in terms of, if you look at demand, I think that there may very likely are a lot of people who would be put off consuming um, wildlife, particularly as, as food, by the conversations around um, health risk and also this policy change we've had in China, which is, is being um, you know, talked about a lot in the media. There are um, awareness campaigns to say, uh, do not eat um, wild animals, um, that it's now banned. And I think a lot of people would be um, you know, deterred by that. So the demand might be impacted on that side. But on the other side, um, we've seen uh, traders who are offering wildlife products on social media, for example, in Laos and Vietnam, and China actually uh, kind of advertising their products as health tonics um, in the context of the, the pandemic. Uh, we've seen even specifically traders offering um, traditional medicine products can uh, list uh, rhino horn as an ingredient directly linked to um, government recommendations for how to treat COVID and, and saying, you know, we've got the real deal. This is the, 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 China, the version that contains rhino horn and it's a treatment for COVID. So we've We've seen that kind of impact, so it's certainly not been um, all one story in terms of the, the demand and discussions on that side. Um, when it comes to the, the movement of contraband, we've also seen some disruption in terms of the fewer flights happening um, for products such as rhino horn, for example, which is quite often used and uh, moved by um, passenger, um, passenger luggage that has been an impediment to the movement of the stock um, and also border closures, for example, the border between um, Vietnam and China, that, uh, which is you know, a, a location of a lot of smuggling of wildlife, um, there seems to have been some impediment there due to the border closure. But what has also happened is um, stockpiling. So we've seen traders in, in Africa, for example, stockpiling um, 
pangolin scales as they wait for the roots to open up again. They haven't stopped buying product, which actually means the species, the animals are still being killed and trafficked from the wild. So we don't know what's going to happen even in the next month um, or, or long term, but the picture from seizure data, so what's been you know, seized from illegal trade and reported, seems to be increasing, getting back um, back up to kind of pre-2019 levels um, each month. So it certainly hasn't stopped. And we clearly need much um, you know, bigger, <laughs> a lot more investment in, in, in tackling this. And we need, we need a, a shift in how this is being approached because COVID certainly has not meant that illegal wildlife trade has gone away. Mm. It seems to me like, I mean, one, one of the things that I, I see happen over and over again is that, you know, um, when it comes to environmental messaging or conservation messaging, we have a, a major communication breakdown. Um, and, you know, it's incredible to have scientists at the table and, and people who've been working directly on the ground uh, talking about these things in, in seminars or on panels. But, but sometimes the missing component is, the, is these incredible storytellers right uh being able to get people who can shift hearts and mindsets yeah, at the table um because it's it's only when you get uh the masses to understand this fully through some kind of clever storytelling that we that we're able to really shift things and and it's it's just it's it's how we've ended up where we are today because because we've had that that sort of massive communication breakdown um i'm hoping that you know um Again, the trade is kind of habitual. It, it is, you know, on one side, it's driven by extreme poverty uh, in the demand, you know, on, on the sort of supply side and then the demand side by greed and um, ego and, and, and wealth. Um, I'm hoping that as the demand side, uh, I'm becoming more and more educated around uh, the issues to do with um, the illegal wildlife trade and consuming um, wildlife, that slowly we will we'll see a dip in, in that um, uh, in, in the, de the demand and therefore the, you know, the guys will, they might be stockpiling, that's habitual, that's, that's all they know how to do, but eventually they'll realize like they did with ivory, um, that there is no, no more demand, right? Or there's, there's reduced demand uh, for, for these products. And that's, that's just what we can hope for. But I do really think that my, uh, one of the things that I would like to do is, is encourage more discussion across different, um, uh, different um so we're not speaking in silos basically uh that we're engaging people from outside our normal uh you know world of uh, wildlife trade um whether it comes in technology uh, media whatever it is um and and engage great minds across uh, many sectors to be able to really sort of come up with different solutions uh, to what we've been traditionally doing because otherwise things won't change, right? Um, now, so can you share a little bit about the role of the physical trade markets restaurants associated to the risks regarding the spillover of coronavirus to humans? I mean, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist by any stretch, so I'd certainly defer to, to Sarah and other experts in that. Um, but in terms of what I've read, um, it, it, there seems to be consensus that uh, a place where many species are kept in the same space, uh, same area, species that wouldn't necessarily be in close proximity with each other under natural circumstances, and also where those animals are subject to high levels of, high levels of stress, which is likely if they've been captured from the wild or if they're being held in small cages, then the, the shedding of pathogens is is increased and the the interaction between species is is increased as well as the interaction between those species and and humans. So. Um, to an extent, those kind of markets um, have, have been receiving a lot of um, attention and in terms of what the risk is to human health. And, and that is right. Those places um, do need to be, to be tackled and, and, and phased out. Um, at the same time, uh, that's not the only um, risk factor. That's not the only way in which we're, we're dealing with the natural world, which is increasing the risk of, of um, zoonotic spillover. And also, and deforestation is a, is a major driver and um, is a habitat destruction encroachment into into these areas for a whole host of complex reasons does um, put us at greater risk so I think there's been something of a tendency particularly in western media this year to say look at those markets in this other part of the country and other part of the world that's the the, the driver that's where um, zoonotic zoonotic disease risk comes from and that's really only part of the picture it's it's not helpful to be kind of um pointing fingers like that we need to be looking globally where are the risks and um, what are we uh, doing that is putting ourselves at, at greater risk of, of of these issues and and how can we 
deal with those and reduce those risks in a way that also tackles the climate and biodiversity crises. Um, that we have, unfortunately, at this point, as we all know, we're, we're living in an age of in, interlapping, um, overlapping, interlinked um, crises, environmental, social, um, and health. And yeah. we do need to be, as you said, coming out of silos and, and having people from many different disciplines in different parts of the world, you know, diverse representation in these conversations. So the people are, are speaking from a position of um, understanding of, of what's going on where they are um, to, to come up with equitable solutions. Um, you know, as there's no uh, environmental justice without social justice. So these mm. conversations are complex and, and we need to have a lot of different people um, at the at the table talking about them um and we need yeah we need to recognize that wherever we are particularly in in, in western countries where consumption levels are, are so high that has a huge impact down in, in terms of, of deforestation in terms of impacts on on biodiversity in other parts of the world and that needs to be looked at just as seriously um as as the zoonotic risk of wildlife markets Mm. I think um just sort of jumping along quickly I think one of one of the one of the things that I've I've have seen has brought the greatest success in conservation is where an NGO who is has the ultimate goal of actually sort of uh, protecting wildlife but actually focuses almost 60 percent on the community uh, because unless you are working hand in hand with the local communities you're going to have very little success in um, uh, preserving the wildlife in their natural natural habitats because you can't go in and say I'm going to protect the tiger elephant rhino uh, but the people don't matter so I think the, the, the best model to be the other ones who uh, focus even more than half of their efforts on um, building a robust, healthy, supportive um, community ecosystem to help facilitate the work that they do in conservation. Now, some of the strategies to reduce illegal wildlife trade, we're going to go into this quickly because I'm aware of the time. We've been uh, doing some deep dives into, into some of these answers. Um, and just like to talk about a couple of examples here. Um, in, in India, we have strong policies uh, in India prohibiting all trade and commercial breeding of tigers, which is really actually helping the conservation. The tiger numbers in India have gone up um, amazingly. Uh, it's quite good. Um, and we could uh, also look at um, what happened with the ivory trade. So um, that's also something that I was involved with, uh, with let elephants be elephants. At that time, we were at the peak of the modern ivory crisis. and. Um, by, I produced a documentary for um, National Geographic, Nigeria Wild and Star World, went to air across um, Southeast Asia. And it was interesting to know that 80% of the consumers didn't know that ivory came from dead elephants. Um, and it was a relatively easy conversion because generally everybody loves elephants. Um, you know, and it was not sold for medicinal purposes. Um, so we, we really just did an extensive education campaign speaking around Asia, showing the realities of where ivory came from. And what was incredible to see was that uh, in my documentary that I produced, we featured both um, the source country and demand country. In that time, uh, it was still legal to buy ivory in Thailand. Thailand was the largest unregulated market for ivory in the world. And there was a legal loophole there because it was legal to sell uh, domestic Thai ivory, which essentially just meant that the world's ivory was being laundered through there. Um, this kind of culminated with me addressing the UN General Assembly alongside Chelsea Clinton. And what was great was Thailand was the, the sponsor of that day. Uh, then legislation changed in Thailand. Um, and a year later, I went back to all of the places that we featured in our documentary and none of them had ivory anymore. Uh, it was challenging to find ivory on the streets. I did eventually find one place who, who had some ivory, but they refused to sell it to me. Um, and uh, and then, you know, when I went back to Africa, and this is something that we don't talk about so much, but we, we, we do see that um, the, as a result of demand dropping, price dropping, uh, the, the actual elephants being killed on the ground in that particular area, and not, not all over Africa, but in the Tanzania and Baseli kind of um, area, the numbers have actually gone down, um, which is, is great to see. So those are some, some successes. And there's this discussion around um, farming wild animals uh, to meet consumer demand. I, I know what my thoughts are on this, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, Aaron, on this. Yeah, I, I think um, often there's the, the conversation happens that if there's you know, persistent demand for this product and it's leading to poaching, 
why not just farm the animal and then there's a, a, a source of that product without having to um, take it from the wild. Um, but in reality, there are many, many examples of this not working and actually making the situation worse. Um, you mentioned tigers. So in, as you said, in, in South Asia, th things are, are looking a little bit better at the moment with some numbers stabilizing and increasing in some areas. And part of the reason is that in countries such as India, there are strong policies which do not allow the um, trade of any tiger parts or the breeding of tigers in captivity for their parts. Um, and there's now very little demand for tiger parts in, in the country. Uh, by contrast, if you look at um, in China where tigers have been farmed for their body parts since the 80s and in Laos since the early noughties, and tigers are extinct in Laos now, um, they're on the edge of extinction in China. Um, so the provision, the availability of uh, captive bred tiger parts has, has not helped. Um, it has, um, it, maintained the market and complicated law enforcement and um, really it made things much, much worse for wild tigers. Um, the Chinese giant salamander is another really good example. It's a the world's largest amphibian, um, which is uh, endemic to China, and it's farmed in its millions across across the country for generally for consumption as food. Um, however, um, a recent um, survey to, to find out uh, wild populations couldn't confirm any surviving wild populations at the site surveyed. Mm. So you have this species that it's available, it's, there are millions in captivity, but because there's been this legal market and these farms, um, it's meant that the, the species were, it was still being taken from the wild either to be passed off as captive bred, so without the kind of costs incurred there, or um, as kind of breeding stock to introduce into the farms. And that's something that we see again and again with many different species, it's not just in China, um, there are leading uh, Vietnamese NGOs are calling for closures of wildlife farms because it's making the situation so much worse. It's, it's uh, keeping the demand alive and also creating this channel through which um, animals can be taken from the wild and passed off as captive bred. And that's, it's not just a problem um, even in those countries, but passing off uh, at the wildlife as captive bred when actually it was taken from the wild or unsustainably sourced happens internationally. It's a major issue in implementation of CITES. So frequently wildlife farming isn't the solution. And that's even without talking about the welfare implications, which I, we absolutely should, should think of as well. Um, of course, not just wildlife farming, farming of any animals, the welfare implications are often horrific. Um, but you know, if we look at the example of bear bile farming in China, um, even if that were to help um, the wild populations, which it has not, um, it's an unacceptable solution in terms of the the horrific treatment that those animals are, um, undergo it's we need to be looking beyond that kind of um treatment of animals as just as resources and and be considering welfare in in policy yeah. making as well well also the, the important role that they play in the ecosystem i mean that's that's one of the most important things and that's directly related relates to us as human beings being able to survive on this planet um with a healthy ecosystem i'm going to take one audience from the question here and i, I know that we're kind of running out of time so i want to be sort of sensitive to everyone's time and also know that we do have a q a that's coming up after, after this so one of the questions that we've had from the audience from uh, catherine is how do we avoid the global rhetoric becoming racist uh xenophobic on this topic do we have the have best practice examples or case studies to learn from? I think this is yeah an absolutely essential issue that that we need to be considering. I mean, from my perspective, as probably many um, watching this webcast um, have been have been very disappointed by quite a lot of the coverage of these issues this year. Which, um, as we've discussed, are complex. There are many different um, drivers of of disease risk and biodiversity loss. Um, but if you were to read um, some British newspapers, for example, you would think that the only problem is um, so-called wet markets. Um, it's, it's inaccurate. Um, it's conflating um, a wet market with a wildlife market. And it's also you know, failing to recognize how complex wildlife trade is and how trading wildlife isn't the only driver of these issues. And often it comes part and parcel with, with these narratives that are frankly racist. Um, as to best practice, I uh, would love to hear, hear what other people think from, from what I do try to do personally is um, whenever talking about these issues is to contextualize them. So when talking about, um, say, a, a policy in China um, that's exacerbating the problem is to make clear that this is a X um, agency or this is a government policy and not not refer to China as a, as a whole, which risks kind of homogenizing um, 
the country and, and the people that live there and um, also where possible amplifying the voices of people in those in those countries um so the experts uh, in china and southeast asia who are working to um to help save biodiversity and and protect uh, human health as well and um, to make clear that as in any country there's a diversity of voices there's a lot of um, debate happening on these issues um and we should kind of prioritize um, those voices and um, where we can um and yeah we, we need to contextualize everything we need to make sure we are not blaming certain countries um all the time particularly um in, in britain i think that happens that we people don't recognize the the impacts of their own consumption and, and activities on biodiversity in other areas um, and really just want to kind of point somewhere else to say that's where the problem is um, you know, we can all uh, do better on this I think um, and it's something that we're, di we're discussing um, a lot but uh, yeah we have to recognize the complexity of, of wildlife trade and, and actively counter um, racist uh, narratives. You know, if, if we see something being talked about in a certain way in a newspaper, we should be um, discussing how that, that's not right, that's not accurate. Um, there is a problem in, in wildlife trade, but it is, it's not the only problem in how we're dealing with, with wildlife, and it's not only happening in one country. Aaron, thank you so much. Um, some incredible insights, I think, for everybody here uh, and great reminders also uh, down to simple actions that we can all take as well and thinking about how, the, how we consume in general. Uh, I think that's really, really relevant. Um, I'd like to th say thank you very much to the Asia Society uh, for having both Aaron and I here. And just a, a reminder that you can register for the Q&A, um, which is coming up directly after this, um, which is, uh, there's a link in the chat window. Um, I'm Nadia. I won't be joining you for the Q&A. It has been a pleasure. Aaron, thank you so much uh, for your insights. And I wish you all a great week ahead. Please stay safe.